Hello, I would like first of all to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and also acknowledge my co-authors Karen Boschman and Camila Munoz for their contributions to this research. I'm going to talk about pronounced enteric methane mitigation with a particular focus on the sustainability of the dairy industry and the goal of getting uh, to carbon neutrality uh, in 2050. An overview of the points I'm going to talk about today as first refers to the importance of enteric methane emissions um, and then I'll discuss two different metrics of greenhouse gases emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions expressed per unit of product, what's called usually um, emissions intensity, and total or absolute uh, emissions of CO2 equivalents. Um, I'll raise a question and try to answer and discuss uh, how much do we need to decrease methane and then present and discuss uh, the um, interventions that can cause pronounced decreases in take methane in the, in, in, in the rumen. Discuss uh, the consequences and, uh, and on rumen and whole animal metabolism and on animal performance. Then I'm going to speculate a bit uh, about uh, whether these interventions of methanogenesis inhibition could be made cost-effective and, and how, and, uh, and then delineate some conclusions. I'll see if I can get a pointer. Excellent. Um, so, the emissions of greenhouse gases are typically expressed as the sum of each individual greenhouse gas weight by its coefficient of global warming potential. In this case, uh, the three main greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, I think this 28 coefficient has been upgraded to 34 based on some uh, indirect effects. Anyway, methane contributes uh, to about 20% of total anthropogenic greenhouse gases emissions, CO2 equivalents globally, uh, but about 10%, half of that, 10% in the US. Not all anthropogenic uh, emissions of methane are from uh, enteric origin, from ruminants. Um, there are other sources. So uh, 27 or 28% are, are, are correspond to enteric methane of the total. So um, that uh, means that uh, globally about uh, 5 to 6 percent of total CO2 equivalent emissions would be accounted by uh, enteric methane and that would be about 3 percent in the US. And um, in, in another aspect, the US dairy industry contributes uh, to about uh, 2 percent of uh, total emissions of uh, CO2 equivalents in the US with 25% uh, of the dairy industry emissions being enteric methane. Now, apart from, uh, from uh, its uh, proportional contribution, uh, it is strategic to mitigate uh, methane emissions because of two reasons. The mitigation impact of, uh, uh, of methane is greater compared to CO2. For each ton that uh, we uh, decrease methane emissions, uh, the impact is going to be 28 times greater compared to CO2. And also because methane has a, a shorter uh, life in the atmosphere than CO2, it's going to be a faster impact that's going to be noticed in, in the shorter term. Uh, but there is also a second reason for which we are interested in, uh, in decreasing the emissions of methane uh, by ruminants. 
uh, and that's because uh, methane formed in the rumen uh, it, uh, accounts for between 2 and 12 percent of ingested gross energy in ruminants that's uh, depending on the diet uh, between 5 and 7 percent with mixed diet as in uh, intensive dairy production and this was the reason uh, historically uh, was the first reason for why animal scientists actually got interested in uh, decreasing methane production in the rumen. Now I want to discuss two different metrics um, of, uh, of uh, total CO2 equivalent emissions and that's uh, emissions per unit of product expressed per unit of product and that's CO2 equivalent emissions intensity and total CO2 uh, equivalent emissions. So we have here eight different case studies from different countries and states. Uh, some of them are, uh, are on dairy, others on beef or lamb and different time periods. And in the first column, I, uh, I calculate uh, yearly rates of change in uh, CO2 equivalent emissions intensity that is expressed per unit of product um, in, from, uh, from what was reported in this work. And uh, in the second column, uh, that, uh, that corresponds to total CO2 equivalent emissions. And what we see in, in this column is that as production intensifies, in, in every case, the emissions intensity decreases. That is, uh, the production of each uh, liter of milk or kilo of beef or, or lamb becomes more sustainable, less CO2 equivalent associated to it. But total CO2 equivalent emissions, um, sometimes they decrease and in other examples, they increase to different extents. And that depends actually on the, uh, the relationship between the relative decrease in emissions intensity and the relative increase in, uh, in total production. So that if total production uh, rate is greater, the increase in total production, the rate of increase in total production is, great, is greater than the uh, decrease in emissions intensity, absolute emissions is, is going to increase. And then intensification decreases CO2 equivalent emissions per unit of product, but lower CO2 equivalent emissions per unit of product does not always mean total uh, less total CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 equivalent. And that's what we see in this graph, in this projection towards the year 2050. The, um, these calculations are based on this study uh, with energy corrected milk by Cap and Caddy uh, for the period uh, uh, 2007 to 2017. And uh, their rates are extrapolated to, to 2017, 2050 um, in this plot. So we are modeling two different scenarios for total CO2 equivalent emissions. A first scenario in which um, emissions intensity remains constant at 2017, uh, at 2017. Uh, levels and total CO2 equivalent emissions increases sustainably uh, and, uh, until we get to uh, 2050. Um, and it, it increases uh, pronouncedly. Um, and this parallels, actually parallels, this increase parallels the increase in, uh, in energy corrected milk production. Now, what happens on the other hand when emissions intensity, the kilos of CO2 equivalent emissions per kilo of energy corrected milk, decrease? 
at the same rate as in this study. Well, when that happens, the projection throws a much lesser increase in total CO2 equivalent emissions. There's a huge difference between uh, the business as usual situation with no increase in uh, sustainability or, uh, or, or decrease in emissions intensity and the, uh, the, the decrease uh, of emission in emissions intensity uh, uh, at a sustained rate. Now, so decreasing CO2 emissions per unit of product is very important to decrease total CO2 equivalent emissions. However, even if we could sustain this rate of decrease in emissions intensity, we can see that the decrease in CO2 emissions equivalent per unit of product by itself is insufficient to decrease total CO2 emissions equivalent equi uh, to the CO2 equivalent emissions if production of energy corrected milk continues to increase as we see here uh, not only we don't get to abatement and carbon ne carbon neutrality but we have a slight increase in total emissions so some uh, specific means to decrease and take methane production are then needed. And which could be those specific target methane? Well, there are various uh, strategies to decrease methane production in the rumen that are being investigated. And I'm go not going to discuss them here uh, and discuss their pros and cons, um, because there are various very good reviews on those, uh, on those strategies. I'm just going to say for now that they have different mitigation potential potentials. Uh, they apply differently to different production systems, and uh, and they and they differ in their closeness to implementation. One to discuss is how much do we need to decrease and take methane emissions, and we argue that moderate decreases in and take methane may be insufficient. First of all, with some mitigation strategies, a moderate decrease in intake methane emissions may be compensated by increased uh, in CO2 or in nitrous oxide emissions at other points in the production chain. Um, second, short-term decreases in methane uh, production per animal may be compensated by future increases in individual animal productivity, resulting in greater methane production of the animals or uh, greater animal numbers. And the third aspect has to do with the savings in, e in energy in methane that could be available for the animal. Uh, the smaller the, uh, the decrease in methane, then the, the smaller the savings in, uh, uh, of energy. So we, we think that uh, in order to achieve the goals of, uh, of a substantial decrease in uh, greenhouse gases emissions from the industry, the decrease in uh, methane emissions per animal need to be also substantial. And there are uh, three mains that we're thinking in that uh, can achieve pronounced decrease in methane production in the rumen, uh, chemical inhibitors, and among them CNOP is the, the closest one to 3 nitroxide propanol, the closest one to commercial application under uh, government registration in some countries. Then there is the red algae asparagopsis. And we have also the possibility of combining uh, various anti-methanogenic strategies that on their own by themselves could uh, uh, promote uh, moderate decreases in, in methane. So here there are some examples of uh, pronounced decreases in methane greater than 80% with chemical inhibitors or algae. And I want to draw your attention to the first three 
uh, these experiments were conducted in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there are others that are close to this figure. So for a long time, we've known that uh, we, we've been able to inhibit uh, methane production in the rumen uh, very strongly. Of course, there are other uh, issues to solve when that happens, and I'll, I'm going to refer to the consequences uh, of uh, methane inhibition, uh, methanogenesis inhibition in, in the rumen and, and in the whole animal. But uh, for now, let's, uh, what I want to, uh, to say is that if the question is, can we inhibit methane production? The, the strict rigorous answer is, yes, we can inhibit methane production. Then we, we have to uh, see how to uh, uh, deal with uh, other issues. Um, um, well, all, all of the experiments that I show you uh, refer to beef and sheep. There are some experiments with uh, dairy in which 80% uh, inhibition was not achieved, but greater than 60%, which is uh, fairly high as well. Um, some examples of combinations of various antimethanogenic strategies that, that were tested in vivo. There are quite a few experiments. Uh, the one thing to, uh, that I want to, to, uh, to emphasize is that to the extent that I am aware, there are no uh, in vivo experiments um, examining three or more strategies uh, for methane abatement combined. Okay, so now we are going to uh, discuss what are the consequences of inhibiting methane production in the rumen on rumen fermentation and metabolism and whole animal uh, metabolism and performance. Um, this is a simplified overview of microbial fermentation in the rumen of car carbohydrates that get metabolized to pyruvate through glycolysis. Um, and glycolysis is sort of a central branching point where the pathways to the main VFA acetate, propionate, butyrate, diverts. There's two different pathways to propionate, but the idea is to simplify um, this, uh, this figure. Um, and what I want to focus on, I, I'm not depicting, for instance, uh, ATP generation, which occurs here. I want to focus on uh, the flows of metabolic hydrogen that are central uh, to understand methane formation. In glycolysis, NADH, NAD plus gets reduced to NADH, and in pyruvate oxidative decarboxylation, the first step in acetate and butyrate formation, um, uh, ferredoxin gets reduced uh, to uh, get also gets reduced. So these two cofactors, in order for fermentation to continue, need to get reoxidized, and to a large extent they do it by producing dihydrogen, donating electrons to protons, and so dihydrogen gets produced, and much of it gets transferred intercellularly to methanogens that reduce CO2 to, to methane, which is then the main electron sink in room and fermentation. It also gets um, incorporated in the reduction of humor to succinate in propionate formation. And, uh, and also we can see that uh, 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 reduced cofactors can dispose electrons into other pathways, uh, propionate and butyrate formation. So this is the, uh, the typical room and fermentation with uh, functional methanogenesis. Uh, so what happens when we inhibit methane production? We inhibit methanogenesis. Uh, the, uh, the maximal rate of growth of methanogen is, uh, is going to decrease. Hydrogen accumulates, and that stimulates propionate production, which incorporates reducing equivalents adding, and inhibits acetate production, which releases them. And that's what we see in this, these two graphs. Uh, these meta-regressions of uh, 19 experiments of methanogenesis inhibition with chemical inhibitors or algae. So as methane decreases in this direction, right, 
methane formation gets inhibited, the acetate to propionate ratio decreases. A shift from acetate to propionate and an increase in propionate concentration. Very important is that actual flows of VFA production have not been measured in these methanogenesis inhibition experiments. Uh, these are concentrations, but we have not demonstrated that that happens with actual production. Uh, butyrate is uh, an electron sink relative to acetate. It, it is not in it an electron sink. It, uh, butyrate production from hexoses releases reducing equivalents. However, um, if there is a shift from acetate to butyrate, there's going to be incorporation of reducing equivalents. And that's what we see here is that inhibiting methane production, again in this direction, stimulates, uh, I won't say butyrate production, but again butyrate concentration. We have not demonstrated that production increases. Um, and I want to refer now to hydrogen accumulation that occurs when we inhibit methane production in the rumen, as uh, nicely depicted in, in this cartoon by Julian Tchaikovsky. Um, the first question that we are asking ourselves is, uh, well, hydrogen also has a heat of combustion. And if hydrogen is expelled, that's a loss of energy. How important are those losses of energy uh, in comparison to the energy saved in methane that was not formed? And that's what we have again here in this, uh, this meta-regression uh, of uh, 25 experiments in which methane production was inhibited with chemical compounds or algae. Um, less methane again in this direction and hydrogen accumulates and we are co comparing energy with energy megajoules per day and uh, we see that our slope here is 0.27 uh, so it means that means that 27% uh, uh, on average 27% of the energy saved in methane is lost in dihydrogen However, this is very variable, as shown by, by this significant interaction. Um, and the distribution is not normal. The median is quite lower than the main, less than 8%. So in 50% of the experiments, the loss of energy as dihydrogen was less than 8% of the energy spared by methane decrease. On the other hand, in 25% of the experiments, Loss, the loss of energy as dihydrogen was greater than 35% of the energy spared by methane decrease. So, uh, highly variable in other words. And something to take into account. Uh, we, so, we want to incorporate that energy into useful product. Uh, but now I'm going to refer to a second aspect that has to do with uh, dihydrogen accumulation and that's the possibility of NADH reoxidation being inhibited because and that's important because if NADH does not get reoxidized to NAD plus that could hold fermentation and digestion and inhibit so inhibit them uh, so let's inhibit methanogenesis again and we accumulate hydrogen and we wonder if this accumulation of dihydrogen could thermodynamically inhibit the reoxidation of NADH to NAD+. And that's going to depend on the concentration of dihydrogen and we see that that's very variable uh, dissolved dihydrogen concentration. Uh, there are no, not many experiments that have measured it. Many experiments measured hydrogen expelled, but not dissolved hydrogen uh, concentration when methanogenesis was inhibited, as in this experiment with nitrate and in this other experiment with dissolved uh, with uh, CNOP, nitroxypropanol. 
Uh, I'm not going to refer also to the uh, special variation in, uh, in hydrogen concentration, which is also very important. Um, but I'm going to uh, pick the highest hydrogen concentration, which is 200 micromolar, to make some calculations of the feasibility of the uh, thermodynamic feasibility of uh, re the reoxidation of NADH with, with uh, uh, in confrontation with reduced ferredoxin at, uh, at that concentration. And this is the predominant uh, mechanism uh, from the latest findings. Uh, so what we see here, uh, this is the, the methanogenesis inhibition hydrogen concentration, is that at 200 micromolar, the reaction is, uh, is slightly, uh, slightly negative. Uh, it seems to be weakly thermodynamically feasible. Uh, maybe uh, reverse uh, rates could be becoming important relative to forward rates and slowing down the overall reaction, but it seems to be feasible. Uh, we also have to take into account that NADH can dispose electrons into other routes. And that's from the point of view of the uh, of the calculations. What does the empirical evidence say? From the point of view of digestibility, um, no overall tract or in situ digestibility impairments has been observed with, uh, when methanogenesis is, is inhibited. But, uh, and I'm not showing it, I, I did find in, the, in these meta regressions a decrease in total VFA uh, concentration. I'm not showing it in, in the interest of time. Uh, so something to, uh, uh, that probably needs to, to be uh, researched a bit more. Um, also, I want to uh, refer to, the, to, the, to this other um, problem is the, is the unknown electron sinks. Um, when we inhibit methane production, again in these directions, these are in vitro experiments in which we, can, can, we, we know production, not just concentration, but production. Uh, batch culture and continuous and semi-continuous cultures. And we see that as we inhibit methane production, methane production decreases in, in these uh, meta regressions. Uh, there is a, a, a steady and consistent decrease in the recovery of metabolic hydrogen in methane, dihydrogen, propionate, and butyrate. So there are some electron sinks where hydrogen is going that are unknown, have not been well characterized. Uh, those could be long chain, more reduced VFA. Um, some making some calculations, they don't seem to be that important. Uh, some intermediates of uh, room and fermentation that are electron uh, carriers, for instance, formate accumulates in some experiments. Uh, microbial biomass is more reduced than substrate, so microbial biomass production and composition can also be important. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you some results in the next slide uh, with regard to microbial biomass. Uh, changes in the pool of reduced cofactors in the ratio of reduced to oxidized cofactors and uh, reductive acetogenesis as shown by some research. Uh, research that uh, could become important uh, uh, with uh, lower methane. Uh, reductive acetogenesis is the, the reduction of uh, CO2 with dihydrogen, but instead of uh, having methane as a product to uh, acetate. So that's a, a, a desirable nutritional product for the ruminant animal. Um, and this experiment refers to the uh, to microbial amino acids as an alternative electron sink to methane. See that in this experiment, 
uh, mystery production was inhibited with uh, these compounds, 19 and 39, uh, and when starch was a substrate providing energy, rapidly fermentable energy and carbon, there was a response in the synthesis of microbial amino acids from ammonia. But uh, that did not happen with, uh, with cellulose. So this is an interesting uh, thing, it's very preliminary, but uh, could be an interesting possibility too. Um, we're now going to discuss what happens to the, the whole animal, what happens to animal productivity. If we are saving energy in methane, uh, so does that benefit the animal? And the answer is that that's not consistent. Uh, in some experiments, uh, the inhibiting methanogenesis resulted in greater productivity, but that's not consistent. Uh, whether for uh, meat, and, uh, that, and that is growth and fattening, or uh, milk production efficiency. Uh, what could be the reason this? Well, uh, we talked a bit about energy savings. Um, if, uh, if moderate, uh, if uh, methane uh, decreases moderate, the energy savings are relatively small. If uh, we are losing 70%, seven, pardon, uh, pardon, seven uh, percent of the energy as uh, of methane, uh, and uh, and we are saving uh, twenty five percent of that. Uh, that means only one point seventy five percent of gross energy. And when we get to uh, metabolizable energy and uh, net energy for maintenance or production, that uh, is uh, quite small and may not be noticeable. In, uh, in most experiments. So that's another reason for why we, we think that uh, uh, methanogenesis inhibition needs to be uh, uh, pronounced. Um, there is a consistent decrease in intake when we decrease methane production in the rumen, and that might be related to the fact that uh, to the, the shift from acetate to propionate as propionate is hypophagic, it may be uh, causing a satiety signal uh, if, it, if propionate absorption and metabolism is increasing. Uh, I'll go quickly through this slide. Uh, there is no, uh, no much of a, of a change in digestibility, um, overall tract, organic matter, and NDF uh, digestibility pretty much unaffected in most experiments. Um, so I want now to speculate about uh, whether methanogenesis inhibition could be made cost-effective and want to discuss three different approaches that uh, uh, do not exclude each other. Uh, the first one is an increased price of the product that might be paid by the market if consumers were willing to pay for a more sustainable product uh, or could be the result of government intervention. I'm not going to expand on this first point because others are probably a lot more qualified than, I'd, than I to, uh, to discuss this. Um, we, we discussed that there, there is no consistent improved, uh, improvement in animal productivity when we inhibit methane production in the rumen. Uh, that said, uh, there are, and as we also discussed, there are many uh, changes in nutrient flows in, uh, in rumen metabolism and absorbed nutrient flows that we still ignore and we may not be taking advantage of. And, uh, and the third point, is also related to uh, some points that uh, we ignore about uh, about uh, how the the rumen and whole animal metabolism uh, may may be changing, and I'm going to explain a bit more in the in the next slide. Um, so we inhibit methane production in the rumen. We know that there are certain changes in rumen microbial metabolism. Some of them 
we know uh, we uh, we have characterized and understood uh, better than others. Uh, there are probably changes in the flows of absorbed nutrients and uh, ch uh, such as changes in total VFA, but also in the profile of absorbed VFA. There might be changes in absorbed amino acids, fatty acids, and others, which may impact uh, post-absorbed post metabolism in tissues. So uh, the question that we are asking ourselves is if we need to reformulate basal diets to accommodate these changes that might be occurring to match animal requirements under the new situation. So accommodate changes in nutrient flows to optimize nutrient utilization. That is, formulate a custom methanogenesis inhibition diet. And I'll give you two examples of that. Uh, if we were to get a greater flow of propionate absorption, and that would cause greater glucose production, greater gluconeogenesis, well, maybe some of the diets, uh, say for instance, for early lactation uh, cows, could be made, formulated to be a bit less glucogenic, uh, which uh, could be cheaper. So the, uh, maybe we don't observe benefits uh, because we look for enhanced productivity and maybe the benefit could be uh, that we could do some fine tuning in diet formulation and have a slightly less glucogenic diet when we inhibit methane production and absorb more propionate. I don't know, it's a question, um, it's a possibility. Same thing uh, with regard to the in vitro experiment I showed you, it's very preliminary, it's a, 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 a very uh, simplified, uh, under very simplified conditions. But more ammonia was incorporated into the synthesis of microbial amino acids, microbial protein. So if it's true that with certain diets we could uh, stimulate um, microbial amino acid synthesis from ammonia, could we replace a greater proportion of expensive plant protein supplements with urea? With urea? Um, and the answer is, of course, to both questions is that uh, we don't know. Uh, that's speculation, but that's something that uh, uh, that we uh, could start thinking about. And, uh, and of course, we would need uh, more basic such to start understanding uh, these kind of uh, changes that can be occurring. So going to the conclusions, decreasing CO2 equivalent, the emissions of CO2 equivalents per unit of product emissions intensity alone would be insufficient to decrease total CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 equivalent emissions, um, if uh, total production uh, continues to increase, that is, if the industry continues to grow. Um, in which case, specific interventions for pronounced intake methane decrease would be required. Uh, to take the best advantage of those interventions and of uh, a strong methanogenesis inhibition, we would need uh, research to achieve a better understanding of changes in the flow of nutrients when inhibiting methane formation, so as to optimize uh, the intervention of methanogenesis inhibition. We also need uh, more research, or we need research on combining three or more strategies of methanogenesis inhibition or mitigation um, to, to study their, their effects when they are combined. And, uh, and finally, of course, I didn't talk about these aspects that are equally important, equally fundamental. Um, uh, whatever intervention or strategy to control methane production we choose, it has to adapt, uh, uh, be able to be adopted in the production system in question. 
uh, it has to be safe, it has to comply with government regulations, and it has to be acceptable to consumers. So this, this is uh, pretty much what uh, I want to to uh, with you today. Um, thank you very much for your attention.